everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. Continuing our series on practicing uh, low light techniques with the handgun uh, in regards to manipulating the light. In this video we're going to talk about transitioning from a handheld to a weapon mounted light. First topic to get out of the way is do you need a weapon mounted light? We're talking specifically about the handgun for concealed carry or even duty carry. And the answer I think is yes. Now some people bring up the, the, the very somewhat reasonable uh, fact that there aren't a lot of statistics, or I should say instances, of a weapon mounted light being used uh, for a shooting outside of law enforcement. There are very, very few. But if you think about how many citizen related shootings happen every year and how sometimes you'll hear about one that happened years and years and years ago and you just now are hearing about it, um, we can't necessarily rely on the absence of data to prove that we shouldn't put a light on a firearm. I think if your carry position or your carry type or your, your, your style of attire allows for it, then it's a great addition. And there's some reasons for that that we'll get into. Uh, the problem with CCW shooting data is it's completely unreliable because there's no central clearinghouse, if you will, to collect it. Whereas in law enforcement, we have the FBI's Law Enforcement Officers Killed and Assaulted database, and then we have the Bureau of Justice Statistics, and we have some other uh, great information sources. Uh, even, at the even at the larger department level, data isn't collected consistently across the board. And the problem with the FBI's LIOCA program is it's self-reporting, which means the department needs to give the information to the FBI. The FBI doesn't go out and find it. So when it comes to citizen shootings, there's, there's only what we're able to find on YouTube or LiveLeak or something that makes national headlines. And even then, you don't necessarily always get the details unless you go digging into a trial, if there is one, to read the transcripts of that trial. So just because there's no information that says it doesn't happen doesn't mean it necessarily uh, doesn't. I've had a few of my students um, recently and in the past who have used their handheld and their weapon-mounted lights. Uh, Specifically, when it came to weapon-mounted lights, um, it became a deterrent, and luckily they didn't have to shoot. So why a weapon-mounted light, then? If there's this somewhat, it's not really a huge debate, but it is a debate that does come up from time to time. A handheld is going to be a default. you got to have a handheld light just because you're going to be not having your gun out much more often than you are going to be having your gun out, hopefully. Uh, and this is a source of information. It's something that a polite society is willing to accept that an average person can just be carrying around in, in low-lit areas or at night outside in an ambient lighting condition wherever you happen to live. Uh, the handheld light is just its something that, that people are just kind of used to seeing. Uh, it's not really going to freak anybody out. Whereas if you pull your firearm out and turn your weapon mount of light on to look for your car keys, that might raise a few eyebrows and be illegal depending where you are. And it's just a horrible idea and something you should never, ever, ever do. Uh, and I think I can say never in that case because that's an administrative task that has no need for a firearm. The handheld light is something we use as a deterrent, which I've talked about in previous videos. In fact, I think the previous video in this series I brought that up. The weapon mounted light is so we can shoot more accurately. Uh, problems I brought up in the handheld video is depending on what kind of position you're going to be using with your handheld light, you might experience some significant accuracy issues over what you're used to shooting, which is the whole purpose of this video. How do we practice? Or the, of these videos, I'd say, how do we practice when we don't have access to a low light range? So, uh, transitioning from a weapon mounted light, or from, I should say, from a handheld light to a weapon mounted light, the biggest problem you're going to have is realistic retention of the handheld light. A good way to practice is going to be a target that you can put some kind of semi reflective material on, such as tinfoil or a gum wrapper. I don't think they really do gum wrappers to like reflective material anymore. I bought a pack of Juicy Fruit recently, and much to my dismay, the wrapper was no longer the venerable foil wrapper, which was I was hoping for, because I could, you know, get some gum and some training aids. It didn't work out that way. So anyway, tin foil works great. Uh, transitioning from the handheld to the weapon mount of light. The biggest problem is going to be how do I retain this, and how do I do it quickly? Because if I'm going straight to the weapon mount of light, I've got to dish this light, and that's okay. It's not ideal, but it's perfectly acceptable because you're giving up one light source for another light source. So if I've got my, my flashlight up and I, I draw my firearm, I can immediately just dump it. Just get rid of it. Throw it on the ground, go to your weapon mounted light, and hopefully, if you have to shoot, you'll be able to do so, or so more accurately based on the practice you put into it. Uh, the other technique that you could use is while you're maintaining light control, bring your firearm up, get your first few rounds of the engagement done, and then Turn your weapon mount light on, stow it, go to your two-handed traditional grip. Momentary versus constant on, I'm going to bring this up because I know somebody's already looking at the video already and they may be seeing something they're not used to. I am a constant on shooter, which means when I'm shooting, the light is on and I'm using my traditional two-handed grip. 
So bang, 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 bang. When it's time to stop shooting or reload or move, I can then roll my finger back and turn the light off, perform whatever I have to perform. I can't do that necessarily or easily with a traditional handheld light in my hand. Uh, and I certainly it's harder to manipulate the weapon mount of light with just one hand than it is when you have two on the firearm. So your options are kind of limited. Now one thing you could do uh, if you're concerned about dropping your light and you want to practice getting your weapon light in the fight immediately is maybe get your first two or three rounds and then immediately sacrifice some of this grip, come straight in, turn the light on, finish your engagement, and then you've retained both of your light sources. One to keep on your known threat, the other one to take a look around, reacquaint yourself with the environment, check for other unknowns, threats, whatever. If you're into the whole search and assess thing, this gives me two light sources. And I can go back to my somewhat modified two-handed grip, or at that point, then stow the light, and then go to a traditional or somewhat modified two-handed grip. Momentary only on the weapon light is okay, uh, but what I found is when people use their thumb in that unnatural position, so if I'm gonna use momentary only, I'm gonna rock up for a left-handed shooter, down for a right-handed shooter on the streamlights. That's not your traditional shooting position, so it might actually cause you to have some accuracy issues that you're gonna to have to practice your way through. And then when you actually get to shoot it under low light, you might find that those accuracy conditions come back because you're unfamiliar with actually shooting under low light conditions. So just a practical application of the techniques we just discussed. I can have my handheld and my neck index or my FBI or, or maybe just even chest index wherever I'm holding light when it, I decide that the weapon needs to come out. Now I want my hot spot on my threat's face to remove their visual horizon, even if that necessarily isn't gonna be my point of aim. If they're a little further away than you're comfortable with for a headshot, you can still go to the chest while maintaining the beam on the face. The reason we want the beam on the face is because we want to remove from them any ability they might have to get information about you, where you are, uh, and what you're doing. You can use the flashlight to conceal the draw of the firearm. It doesn't always have to be a speed draw. It can literally be, while you see the situation is escalating to an unavoidable confrontation, you can go ahead and make a surreptitious draw, a concealed draw, a quiet draw, a sneaky draw, whatever you want to care, whatever you want to call it. As long as you maintain proper light control and the situation starts to de-escalate, you can put that firearm, a firearm away. Now again, I'm not advocating that any time you make on, eye con or make contact with an unknown individual that you get light control and pull your gun. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there's millions and millions of possible situations that you may find yourself in that I can't even possibly pr predict. So a concealed draw under cover of light control is an option. It's something that uh, I teach to law enforcement guys all the time. I teach it to citizens because it's a very versatile technique based on a situation you may find yourself in. It might be the right tool for the job. But getting back to what we're talking about, I've got my weapon or my handheld light up. I've established my visual control of my threat or my unknown. Situation escalates, have to draw the gun. Now, if I've if I'm not worried about retaining this, as soon as the firearm comes out and I'm able to present, I may take my first shots and then I'm ditching that light, activating my weapon light, finishing my engagement. Now I can go back and get that light whenever I feel like I'm able to do so. But until that happens, my only light source is going to be my weapon mounted light. Now realistically, you're probably in an environment where there's enough ambient light that you do not need the weapon mounted light to scan unknowns, other individuals, things like that. So you don't have to worry about muzzling people who don't deserve to be muzzled. In the event that you are in an environment where it's very scotopic and they're just like literally without the weapon light, you really can't see anything at all. Everything is grayscale, you know, got no color vision, can't really make things out very well. Then finding that light can be important. And it's pretty easy to do just with the spill of the weapon light while maintaining a, uh, a light source on your threat. You find it, you step on it, then you can bend down, pick it up, while maintaining muzzle on your threat, especially if that threat has surrendered necessarily, but isn't uh, unconscious. Now, the next technique that we discussed, uh, I've got my light establishing light control, the firearm comes out, one, two, three rounds, I'm then gonna activate my weapon light with my primary hand's uh, index finger. Boom, now I can retain that light. If I had to shoot again right now, I could. Then I'm gonna establish my proper two-handed grip, finish the engagement. Um, if I'm relatively, I feel relatively comfortable that my threat is down, I can even produce that light, especially in a very scotopic environment, and use that light to maybe control an unknown person or to check for other threats. Um, you have two hands. If you're comfortable shooting one-handed, there's no reason you can't do this. This may seem a little strange for some people because they've never seen it before, but there's not a whole lot of problems 
relatively speaking, with proper practice and proper training to operating two lights at the same time. But I, I don't want to call it an advanced technique, but it's definitely one that you have to practice. And it's not necessarily going to be a default setting. Like I said, again, the environment you're likely to be in is going to have enough ambient light or may have enough ambient light that you wouldn't necessarily need to use a technique like this. Now, you might ask, why are you just go ahead and why are you supposing that there's going to be ambient light? Because if your threat doesn't have a flashlight, or he's not wearing night seeing goggles, if it's so dark that you can't see him without a flashlight, it's probably the same for him, which means that environment might not necessarily be one that he's going to attempt a, a personal crime or a passion crime or random act of violence. Uh, so outside of a very certain demographic of criminals, like maybe he's in the shadows, but he's going to observe you from the darkness and the light that you're in. There's going to be some kind of ambient lighting, probably. I'd say with a high likelihood. Doesn't necessarily mean there isn't going to be, or I should say, it doesn't mean that there, that's going to be the case. So you need to practice kind of for both eventualities. Now, the next technique is probably my least favorite when it comes to the handheld light, but it is functional. So I've got my light control. The firearm comes out. I may make one or two shots. Then I compromise my support hand grip to retain my light. I can fire again if necessary, but I'm going to have a very compromised shooting grip because I'm pressing the flashlight into the firearm body. It's not something I like to do, but it is an option and maybe practice for it just in case you forget to ditch your light. Another issue you run into when it comes to handheld lights is reloading. Uh, if you reach a reload, you've expended, you know, however many rounds of ammunition are in your magazine. That reload could be administrative, but let's say for the sake of argument that it's not. You haven't gotten the work done with the ammunition that was in your gun. You need your spare magazine. You need the ammo in it. You need it now. You've gone to slide lock. Uh, put it anywhere you can as quickly as you can if you still have it in your hand. If it's not in your hand and you're on your WML, you can kill that WML for your reload, turn it back on, go back to work. It's not really going to be a considerable issue as long as you remember to turn that light off because the way that you're going to manipulate the firearm in order to reload it generally is going to be up and angle the barrel. Uh, that means the weapon light is coming off of your threat, which means he may be able to then see you again based on the distance of the engagement and the quality of your light. So, my preferred way to use a, a handheld light is with a, a Theorem switchback. Any retention device is going to work. Theorem is my preferred one. The reason for that is it allows me to retain my handheld light at all times, uh, regardless of what I'm necessarily doing with the firearm. Now, if you're not familiar with the Theorem switchback, I have a video on it. You can go check it out. But basically, long story short, it allows me to maintain a proper two-handed grip on a firearm while being able to activate the light by pushing on this little spoon, which pulls the light back into my knuckle, which activates the light via the touchpad on the back which is super cool. Uh, but because I carry a weapon on light, I'm still gonna use this because as I transition from my handheld light to my handgun, I can just roll the light, it just kinda hangs off my finger and it's still there if I need it. Uh, so I may finish my engagement and then I can roll the flashlight back, do whatever else I need to do with it. If I need to reload the firearm, not a big deal because the flashlight just kinda hangs out there and reload, even if it's a tactical reload or an emergency slide lock reload, like it's not a big deal because the flashlight just kind of hangs out, and if I need it, it's there. Uh, as far as those of you who are using Theorem switchbacks, the biggest thing you can, or any retention vice at all, the, any, the biggest thing that you can do to practice with that is practice making that transition. So as the gun comes out, maybe pop, 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 comes off, activate weapon light, I'm able to shoot, I'm able to engage, and then practice, if you want, then utilizing the light for other things. Uh, biggest thing to remember when transitioning from uh, a handheld light to a weapon mounted light is when you transition to the weapon mounted light, unless your point of aim is the face, your hot spot is probably going to go to that threat's high thoracic, which is where the major, I should say, I should say the majority of shooters are taught as their default point of aim, which makes sense. High thoracic is a good place to put bullets. It's not the best, but it's a good one. It's a large uh, target area. It's got a reasonable margin of error. Um, when you go to the weapon mounted light, you're going to give up. Uh, some of your light control uh, and to a considerable amount of light control depending on the quality of the light that you're using If you're using one of these little concealment lights, it's only 200 lumens uh, And there's a lot of ambient light and photonic barriers and all kinds of nonsense going on You may be giving up a considerable amount of control transitioning from a really high lumen handheld to a lower lumen uh, Concealment light that you got because it looked cool because it was flush to the gun and it looked great on Instagram and it, it conceals really well 
carry enough light just like you would carry enough gun. If you carry a, a 600 to 1000 lumen handheld light, I'd recommend that your weapon light is at least that bright. Handheld lights tend to have more flood and a wider hot spot, so you're not giving up as much as you would with a rifle light at close ranges. Uh, but the intensity matters, and where that hot spot is placed matters. Regardless of what handheld you carry, what weapon amount of light you're using, if you're using a retention device or not, the biggest thing is to practice drills that, that uh, go from most likely to least likely and work on those functional distances. Uh, start within conversation distance and work your way back to 25, or start at 25 and work your way up to conversation distance. Practice your speed draw or your quick draw, your, your, your fast access one-handed draw. Uh, and then work your way, and then maybe work in some uh, concealed draws. There's this repetitious draw where you know I'm maintaining the light control, and then uh, I get the gun out, um, just in case the situation escalates to a point where I need it because I feel like it's going that way. Uh, it's a niche technique, but it may be something that's it's a good idea to practice and at least have it in your mind as an option, depending on the situation that you find yourself in. Um, I found that you know the 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 wider uh, variety I have of options. Um, the faster I'm going to think through and problem solve a problem. Now, I don't want to have a default method of operation necessarily because that might, necessar might not necessarily address the situation I'm dealing with. And that's why practicing is so important. The biggest problem, this whole topic of this vi these videos is ranges you may not have access to um, that allow for low light shooting. Indoor ranges are, you know, somewhat dimly lit depending on high, how quality their lighting system is, but it doesn't really replicate what you're going to find probably around where you live or where you normally go. So you may be reduced to just practicing the techniques in daylight at the range or indoors at the range using your handheld light and having some of the old FUDs down there shooting uh, whatever they're shooting, uh, looking at you kind of strange because you're one of those new cool tactical kids or, or whatever. And that's fine uh, because that his life isn't yours, your life isn't his. <sighs> Biggest things to focus on besides maintaining your accuracy is being able to uh, keep the hot spot exactly where you want it to be as long as you want it to be there. And that's why, you know, I keep bringing up like something reflective on the target because if it's super bright, you're not necessarily going to see the beam of your flashlight uh, as well as you might, especially as you increase distance. Um, so a reflective media of some sort is definitely beneficial for that kind of practice. Outside of that, you can take the same standards you're already maintaining for accuracy at whatever distance you're shooting, 3, 5, 7, 10, 15, 20, on and on and on back, and apply them to weapon-mounted lights, and apply them to handheld lights, and apply them to one-handed shooting. There's absolutely no reason why you can't shoot as accurately at night as you can during the day. One of the potential differences is you might not be able to do it as fast, not necessarily because you can't get your sights back or you can't get the light where you want it, but because even really high quality self-defense ammunition can produce enough smoke that you can't see through it, especially if you're using one of those anemic 200 lumen weapon lights. I'm Aaron Count with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.